Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you this morning. Uh, and a big welcome as well to everyone that's joining us online. As you can see, I think there is a few people away. We've all been hit this week uh, at different points. And uh, so I imagine there's a lot of people watching this morning online. So uh, good morning to you and great to have you with us. Well, uh, let's get into it. I'm so expectant today that God is going to speak to us. Uh, uh, communion. That was really powerful, Tiramonti. Thanks to you. Uh, worship was incredible. I really believe that uh, the Holy Spirit is going to continue to speak to us today uh, and that we would leave different. And so we're continuing, as Sam said, in a series uh, called On Track. And the purpose of this series really is to just give us a snapshot into some of the incredible discipleship courses that we have available to us here at City Life called Life Tracks. And these are discipleship courses that everyone can be engaged in, whether you've come to church today for the first time or whether you've been around for five years. Life Tracks is for you. And a couple of weeks ago, uh, our senior minister, Andrew Chisholm, he spoke about uh, how our vision for this year, as part of our vision, is that we are taking steps in growing in our relationship with Christ. We're doing things that help us to grow in our faith. And he gave us the challenge. The challenge is for every single one of us to do one thing that grows us in our relationship with God. And for somebody, that step could simply be getting water baptised, if you've not yet been water baptised. It could be making a recommitment if you've distanced yourself from God. You know, it could be doing the Alpha course. It could be doing one of the life tracks. You know, the step might look different for each of us, but the challenge is the same. I'll say that again, right? The step might look different for each of us, but the challenge is the same. And so this is my question for us, Whittlesey. What are we doing to grow in our relationship with Christ in the second half? of this year? What are you doing in the second half of this year to grow in your relationship with Jesus? You know, I, I've spoken about this before, but for me, you know, I want to always be growing in my walk with Christ. I want to know Jesus more this year than I did last year. Who's with me? I want to know Jesus more this week than I did last week. I want to know Jesus more in the second half of this year than the first half of this year. Amen? You know, at Epic Youth, we're also taking a step together. And a big shout out to Epic Youth. Yeah, yeah. You could have left me. I mean, half the Epic Youth team are serving in kids' church. So if it was quiet, it would have been all right. But Epic Youth, and a big shout out, Epic Youth, we run a youth program Friday nights here at the church for high school age young people. Come along this Friday. It's going to be incredible. We want to see you there. Uh, but Epic Youth, we are also taking a step together. But we've tweaked the language to make it sound a bit more kind of, you know, Gen z -y. And so instead of taking a step together, we've called it Level Up. Level Up. At Epic Youth, we are levelling up in our faith. Parents, your young people this year, we're telling them they need to level up. And all that simply means is they need to kind of upskill, do something that grows their relationship with Jesus. Feel free to steal that language if it helps you. Level Up. Everyone say Level Up. Level up. And so today I want to talk about Life Tracks 5. And as Sam said, Life Tracks 5 is about group life. It's about the importance of small groups, of gathering together in smaller circles. And, you know, I have an agenda today with this message. And obviously all preachers have an agenda whenever they speak. But I'm going to be honest, Sam. My agenda today is to convince you to sign up for Life Tracks 5. That, that's, that's my goal. In fact, if you sign up now, I would put the mic down. We're, we're done. That's a joke. That's a joke. Uh, but that's my agenda. You, know, you could take any step in the second half of this year. And my hope is that you'll take many steps. But actually, my goal today is trying to convince you to, to make one of those steps life tracks five. And so that's where we're heading today. But I want to pray and then let's jump in. God, I just thank you for today. I thank you, God, that we can gather. I thank you that we can hear your word. I thank you that we can have relationships together. And so, God, I just pray a blessing over all the words that are about to come out of my mouth, God. May they be your words. May they impact us. May they change us. May they convict us. And may they make us more like you. In your name, Jesus. Amen. I'd like us to turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 42 to 47. And Acts is a book that's written by a guy named Luke. 
And in this particular passage, which I imagine you know well, he outlines some of the characteristics that shaped the early church. Uh, this, this, this incredible movement where the church was birthed and so much of it is relevant for us today. And so I want to read this passage and draw out a couple of things. Acts chapter 2, it says this about the early church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You know, a few years ago, uh, my story, which I've shared before, Shree and I grew up in Perth and we moved to Melbourne seven years ago. But a few years back when we were still in Perth, we were starting a brand new life group in somebody's home. And it was a young adult life group. And Shree and I, we were going to run the life group, but we'd found another couple to host it in their house. So they were hosting it, but we were going to run it in their house. And I remember the first night that we gathered for this life group and Shree and I, we, we pulled up into their driveway. A few other young adults arrived at the same time. And so there's about six or seven of us in total. And so we walked into the house together and the door was open, the, the porch was on, the front light, which is always a good sign. They're expecting you. Yeah? So, so we walk on in to the house for life group. Now, the design of this house was that the master bedroom was at the front of the house. And then there was a long hallway, a passageway that went to the back of the house where the kitchen and the living area was. And that's where we were going to meet for the life group. And so to get there, we had to walk past the front bedroom and down this hallway. And so I remember that we're walking down this hallway to get to the back of the house, about six or seven of us. And as we're walking down this passageway, they had like an extra front lounge on the left-hand side. And as we're walking past the lounge, I just happened to see out of the corner of my eye a figure, a person hiding behind the couch. And I comment to Shri, I say, Shri, I think there is someone hiding behind the couch. She agrees. We all saw it. There, there was someone hiding behind the couch. I'm like, who is it? You know, who's behind the couch? And in that moment, all of a sudden, the husband, the wife is in the kitchen, but the husband, he pops his head from behind the couch and says, it's just me, guys. It's just me. Now, his body's hidden behind the couch. It's just his head <laughs> popping out. And I'm like, mate, what are you doing? We've got life group. Come on out. Come join us for life group. And he explains that he can't come out from behind the couch. And obviously the group, six or seven of us, we're, we're a bit confused by this. What's going on? And we try and convince him to come out. He won't come out from behind the couch. And in that moment, he goes on to explain sheepishly that he can't come out from behind the couch because he has no clothes on. He is only in his undies. True story. Shree was there. True story. Now, obviously, we're shocked by this. What is going on here? And he goes on to explain what happened. He was at the back of the house in the laundry, putting his clothes into the wash and had tried to do that undie run, which many people have tried, where you run from the laundry to the bedroom, which for them was at the front of the house. And so he was running down this hallway to get to the front bedroom. But we had just walked in. And so he had to quickly duck behind this couch and hope that he'd be unnoticed, but we happened to see him. One of the most memorable life group experiences of my life. And I bet you guys have some as well. At City Life, this idea of gathering together, small groups, uh, is part of the DNA of our church. It's part of the core of who we are. And the reason for that is because life groups matter. Life groups matter. And the reason they matter is because church is bigger than what we're doing right now. Church is bigger than simply the large corporate gathering. You know, for many people, this can be the extent of it. And we can end up thinking that this is what church is all about. But actually, church is so much bigger than this. Discipleship and growing in our faith does not only occur in a large context setting. There's more to it. 
Church isn't just the large gathering that we have on a Sunday. This is one expression of it. But the other way that we grow is through community and personal connection with other Christians. You know, we can hear all the sermons in the world, but our faith is outworked in community. I'll say that again. We can hear all the sermons in the world, but our faith is outworked with other people, is outworked in community. We need each other. You know, in other words, and this is my first point, church is more than just a preach. I've got three points today for Louis or Nick, depending on who we're saying. <laughs> I've got three points today. My first one is this. Church is more than just a preach. Rather, it's through community and personal connection with other believers that spiritual growth occurs. You know, I heard someone say once about small groups. They said, life change happens in circles, not in rows. Life change happens in circles, not in rows. And I'm not saying that to diminish what we're doing right now. Life change happens here as well. It definitely happens here. We know that. But actually, life change also happens when we're hanging out, doing life, rubbing shoulders with other Christians. And the reason why community plays such a, a strong part in, in our walk with Christ is because we were created for community, right? In Genesis 2 verse 18, God says it's not good for man to be alone. So he created Eve. Guys, are we happy about that? Yeah. He created Eve. It's not good for man to be alone. You know, God, He models relationship through the eternal relationship of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God created us for relationship, but He also models relationship. God created us for horizontal relationship with each other, but also vertical relationship with Him. You know, one of the things that Life Tracks 5 teaches is this idea of dynamic discussions. Dynamic discussions. And I've got a definition on the screen. This is my definition. It says this, a dynamic discussion is where each person in the group is contributing to the conversation, expressing their viewpoints and asking others what they think. This is a key part of life groups, dynamic discussions. And you might be thinking, this sounds easy. A dynamic discussion sounds easy. But life group leaders in the room, you know that this is not easy, right? You know, a dynamic discussion is actually quite hard. In life group settings, often you've got those that don't talk at all. And then you've got the other extreme, you've got those that over-talk. Anyone sitting next to an over-talker this morning? Don't raise your hand. And so a dynamic discussion is one where you're kind of holding that balance and you're getting everyone contributing to the conversation. And as Christians, we grow in our relationship with Christ from dynamic discussions. And I want to unpack why this is the case. We grow from our relationship when we hear about other people's experiences. You know, through life groups, our faith grows. Through life groups, our faith grows grows. You know, a scripture that is quite close and we use it a lot here at City Life Whittlesea is Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. You know, this is what happens when we go to life group. We get sharpened. We get sharpened at life groups. That's the why for life groups, to get sharpened in our faith. And that's because we learn from other people's lived experiences. You know, whether or not you've been a Christian for five minutes or five years, you've got lived experience that is of benefit to somebody else. You know, if you hear nothing else, hear that one today, because I think we can often think that we've got nothing to contribute. You know, the more mature believer probably has a lot more to say. But, you know, your lived experience, nothing is ever wasted. The Bible speaks about that. You've got something to contribute, something that's going to benefit somebody else in their faith walk. Through life groups, our faith grows. And the faith journey is hard alone. But when we share our experience with somebody else and when we invite them to share their experience back with us, that's when we sharpen each other. Through life groups, our faith grows. You know, through life groups, we receive, or through life groups, we grow in wisdom. Proverbs 11 verse 14 in the message translation. I love this. It says this, Without good direction, people lose their way. The more wise counsel you follow, the better your chances. Without good direction, people lose their way. The more wise counsel you follow, the better your chances. Wisdom is a gift from God and we need 
the wise counsel of others. That's why we need community with other Christians because we need their wisdom. We get wisdom from God. Proverbs speaks all about that. Proverbs is it's wisdom literature. But we also get wisdom from the advice of others. And that's why it matters that we hang out with other Christians. And you know, when we pursue wisdom, we actually pursue God. Therefore, when we pursue relationship, we're pursuing God. How cool is that? Third one, life groups, uh, through life groups, we receive encouragement. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11, it says this, So encourage each other and build each other up, just as you're already doing. Encouragement is powerful and transformative. We need encouragement. The faith journey is not an easy one. And it's actually through life groups, it's through that small group setting that we can receive encouragement. Church is more than a preach, amen? It's more than a Sunday gathering. This is one aspect of it, an important aspect, but there's more to it than just a corporate gathering. And then life groups are biblical. This is my second point. Life groups are biblical. You know, whilst the term life groups is not found in the Bible, small groups, it's not directly found in the Bible, but the concepts of life groups, community, relationship, service to others, uh, uh, discipleship, love, service to others, that's all found throughout the Bible. And in Hebrews 10 verse 24, it says this, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some of you are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. You know, this passage speaks to the fact that there should be a culture of support and encouragement within the Christian community. That should be the culture of it. And there is a reason why we gather, and the Bible speaks about this. We gather to edify each other. Why do we do this in the first place? To edify. And edify is simply Christianese for being built up. We gather to build each other up in our faith. That's the why behind it all. Uh, you know, you could use epic language. We gather to level each other up, right? Take it if it helps. We gather to level each other up in our relationship with Christ. But, you know, we don't get built up at home on the couch by ourselves. And obviously, there's probably people watching that are at home on the couch by themselves. And so, and so there's a place for that. And I love, you know, I'm speaking to myself. Anyone else a homebody here? Like you just love being at home. There's nothing I love more than being in pyjamas on the couch. That's my happy place. I love it. But I don't get built up. I get relaxed. I unwised. But I don't necessarily grow in my relationship with Christ on the couch. And obviously you can be on the couch watching a sermon online and that's one aspect of growing. So I'm not diminishing that at all. But nothing replaces this kind of environment. Amen? We grow from doing life with other people. We grow when we're rubbing shoulders with other believers. We gather to build each other up. That's the reason. That's the reason we gather to build each other up. You know, I, I've shared a bit about my story before, uh, but for Sheree and I, so we moved from Perth to Melbourne seven years ago, and I've shared that before. But what uh, people often don't realise is the part two of this story, and that is that Melbourne was just a stopover for us seven years ago. So when we left Perth, moved to Melbourne seven years ago, we only had a six-month plan for Melbourne. We had come here to see some family, to finish off some study, but we actually were on our way to London. We had long-term plans to be living in the UK and we had British passports that would have meant we could live there and we were talking to potential employers about jobs over there. So that was where we were heading. But seven years ago, we ended up coming to Melbourne and uh, for this six-month kind of just window and we ended up walking into a church here in Melbourne in the city and we got connected we joined a life group. We made friends with people that we're still friends with today. And the result of joining that small group and building relationships was that we're still here seven years later. We never made it to the UK. Our British passports are dusty. If you need a British passport, I'll give you mine. We haven't touched ours. And what I learned from that experience was that people hang around for community. People hang around when they've got relationships. And I've got a photo that I think will come up on the screen. 
This was a photo of Shri and I when that life group farewelled us. And obviously we look younger there. I was going through a phase where just number one all over. But this is a photo of Shri and I covered in post-it notes of encouragement. This was the way that that life group sent us off. Post-it notes of what they believed in us, what they saw in us. Uh, Post-it notes of just a good experience that we'd shared together. There is a reason why we gather. We gather to build each other up. Amen? And the Bible shows us two kinds... We can get that photo off now. (laughs) The Bible shows us two kinds of gatherings. And, And there's obviously more, but this is two of the main examples in the Bible of when Christians would gather together. And the first I've already talked about is this large gathering, this this large context of gathering together like we're doing today. And an example in the Bible of a large gathering is the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew uh, 5 to 7, when Jesus teaches a stack of different teachings. And we don't know how many people were present at the Sermon on the Mount, but the Bible says that great crowds followed Jesus to hear his teaching. Great crowds is the language there. Other translations say that multitudes followed Jesus to hear his teachings. And so we don't know how many people were present at the Sermon on the Mount, but you can assume from that kind of language, great crowds, multitudes, that there were a lot of people present when he was teaching in that moment. And so that's one example of a a gathering. But then the other example is, is the small group gathering. And I opened up with Acts Two earlier, Acts 2 verse 46. And, you know, the early church, it says about them, it says every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. That's a large gathering. But then they also broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. There's examples of both in the Bible. You know, another example is, did you know that Jesus and the 12 disciples uh, was the first life group, the first example of small group that we have? Jesus was a life group leader. You know, Jesus did life with 12 disciples. They travelled together. They, they, they shared stories. They laughed. They, they learned. They prayed together. Jesus modelled it, doing, doing small group life with other people. And then back to the early church. You know, what's interesting is when Jesus ascended to heaven in Acts chapter 1, the early church was 120 people. But then by the time we get to Acts chapter 2, The early church has exploded to over 3,000 people. Incredible, incredible. And what's so fascinating about how the early church got bigger and bigger, it says that they continued to devote themselves to one another in community. They got larger, but they continued to do life together, meeting regularly and sharing their lives together. That's Christian community. Life groups are biblical. The church is more than just a preach. Life groups are biblical. My third point, life groups complement the larger gatherings. Life groups complement the larger gatherings. In other words, it's a both thing. You know, when combined, the larger gatherings of church with the smaller gatherings of life groups or small groups create a transformative environment for spiritual growth and Christian community. You know, it's not one or the other. The Christian needs both for discipleship. Often that's not the case. Often we come to church and so we're too busy for a midweek group or whatever that might look like. Or we're in a life group and so we're too busy to come to church. But it's not one or the other. We need the corporate teachings of church, but then the intimate relationships of a life group. We need the encouragement that comes through corporate worship like today, How encouraging is it when you've got your hands raised, you turn behind, everyone else is doing the same thing. That's encouraging. We need that kind of atmosphere. But then we also need the accountability of the small group. We need the programs that are available to us in a large corporate setting, epic youth, young adults, various programs for different demographics. But then we also need the in-depth Bible study that you can get in a small group that perhaps you can't get on a Sunday morning. It's a both thing, amen? It's a both thing. And I know I'm speaking to people that know that already, but what a good reminder. And did you know, did you know that there is a life group in our church that is incomplete because you're not in it? There is a life group in our church that is incomplete because you are not there. They're gathering, but there's an empty chair with your name on it, waiting for you to jump into that 
life group. And I'll, I'll illustrate that with this story. You know, I want everyone to picture for a moment, and I'm going to finish with this one. But picture for a moment your favourite holiday meal. Just take 10 seconds. Your favourite holiday meal. And this is the food that you can only have on a holiday because it takes so many hours to prepare. You can't do it during the work week. You, you need a bit of extra time. You know, this is your holiday meal because it's got so many calories in it that you can't have that, you know, when you're meant to be eating healthy during the week, right? Your favourite holiday meal. Imagine then being invited out to dinner at somebody's house and they say to you that they're cooking all your favourites. And then you get there and this favourite thing that you're thinking about, your favourite food, is not on the table. What a sad day. <laughs> you get there, everything else is there, but this particular meal that you're thinking about, it's not there. And in that moment, you realise that the meal is incomplete. And that's exactly what I'm talking about with life groups. When you're not there, it's incomplete. And the reason for that is because you've got something to offer. You know, the Bible speaks about spiritual gifts. And I've spoken about it before here at church. Spiritual gifts. These are gifts given to us by God to build up the body of Christ. And the Bible speaks about how every single one of us has received a spiritual gift. If you are a follower of Jesus, you've been given a spiritual gift. You could be given more gifts, but we know that we've got at least one. You know, it's through small groups, it's through life groups that we're able to utilise our spiritual gifts. If you're looking for a space to, to use the God-given gifts that He's given you, get into a life group. Not only that, it's through life groups that we can discover what our gifts are. You know, you might be here and you're going, what is my spiritual gift? I, I don't quite know. Join a life group. Hang out with other believers and let them identify that particular gift in you. Amen? The church is incomplete without you. Life groups are incomplete without you. I'd love to invite the band to come up. And I'm going to start to close. You know, I think... I like to think that I've put forward today a pretty good argument for the benefit of small groups and this idea of gathering together and that life groups are important within the church context. But you know, to have life groups, we need to have life group leaders. I'll say that again, right? To have life groups, we need to have life group leaders. And I really do believe that God is calling people in this church to life group leadership. Perhaps it's something that God's put on your heart uh, just very recently, even today during this message. But perhaps it's something that God's put on your heart for the last three months, the last six months, and you've just been pushing it aside. To have life groups, we need life group leaders. And so if you do think that God is calling you to that, if you think that that could be your next step, we're talking about steps. Maybe your next step is starting a life group. Come and speak to me, speak to Sam. We would love to connect with you about that. But not only do we need life group leaders, we need good life group leaders. We need life group leaders that know how to, how to lead dynamic discussions that I referenced earlier. And so Life Tracks 5, which is starting this Wednesday night, this Wednesday online, you can do it at home. Uh, life Tracks 5 is all about equipping us to lead small group gatherings. How do we facilitate a dynamic discussion? Life Tracks 5 teaches about that. And so if this message has, has just startled anything, started anything for you, uh, can I encourage you, if you want to find out more, check out Life Tracks 5. If you are a life group leader in the room, check out Life Tracks 5 and upskill. Learn a bit more about how to facilitate discussions and how to lead life groups. And then my last one for today is perhaps there's people here today and what I spoke about, I've spoken about spiritual growth, discipleship, going deeper. And perhaps all of that sounds good to you, but it feels a bit distant. You know, some of these things that can occur in a small group setting, you're going, oh, I'm not really growing. I don't feel like I'm being discipled. Can I encourage you to get into a life group? The Christian walk is really hard to do alone. It's really hard to do alone. We need other people. Iron sharpens iron. Are you being sharpened? The best way for that is in a small group. And we've got a stack of different small groups. We need more, but we do have many. And I would love to give you more information out in the Connect stand about that as well. Amen? Amen. Amen. I hope that you take something from this message. I hope it's challenged you for nothing else to realise that there is significance. There is significance in the gathering and that we need to be doing it. Amen?
Amen. I'm going to pray uh, that over us and then we're going to jump to a worship song. God, I just thank You so much that we can gather, that today we've sharpened each other. And so Jesus, I pray, God, that that would continue. For each person here, God, that we would continue to seek relationships with other believers, even if they're hard, uh, even if people can be difficult at times, Jesus. Help us to know that the best place for us is in community with other people. May it start with us in this room. May we be leaders in that space, leading uh, in, the, in the desire to wanting to gather, Jesus. I pray that over every single person here, God, and for those that perhaps feel a bit distant from You, a bit dry in their faith, a bit burnt out even, God, I just pray that You would refresh them right now. And I pray, God, that You would draw other believers to them that You would put on people's hearts in this room for, for those in their circles that perhaps are feeling a bit distant. God, that You would give us courage to approach them, courage to invite, courage to rub shoulders with them. Help us to model that well. Help us to model what You modelled, Jesus. Help us to reflect Your character to other people in loving others, Jesus. And so we just thank You for that again. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everybody said... Amen. Why don't you stand? We're going to worship.